so in Griswold v. Connecticut, we see a reemergence of substantive due process. Um, and it, it's very much the court uh, dealing with an issue that it thinks is intrinsic to the Constitution, but providing, but finding no mechanism by which to put it there. And so it falls back to substantive due process, um, an unpopular method to include something into the Constitution, which is proven to be exceedingly popular. Uh, so in Griswold v. Connecticut, uh, a state law in Connecticut that had been on the books, I think I read this since the 1880s, um, banned the use of contraception or contraceptives or any sort of counseling on the use of contraceptives. And there existed a criminal penalty for violation of that law. Well, the defendants in this case uh, absolutely knew what they were doing when they opened up a Planned Parenthood in Connecticut. Um, a doctor prescribed contraceptives to a married couple. They were very clearly arrested and charged with a violation, um, a criminal violation of the law. But they knew what they were doing. They did this on purpose to challenge the law in Connecticut. Uh, the issue is, is pretty simple. Um, is the law constitutional? whether or not the law is constitutional and whether it violates notions of separate of uh, substantive due process. Uh, the Supreme Court holds that the law in this case, a law banning the counseling or use of contraceptives is unconstitutional. Um, and the court does this on the basis of privacy. This is a very well written opinion. Um, by Justice Douglas, but it's one that you would absolutely have to break out the thesaurus um, unless you're an astronomer. So Douglas writes that even though privacy isn't within the Constitution explicitly, it exists within the penumbras that emanate from the Bill of Rights. So I guess we should ask, uh, and answer, what is a penumbra? In a technical definition, a penumbra is the shadow cast by the moon during an eclipse. So what Douglas is arguing is that when you look at the Bill of Rights as a document, nowhere within it will you find privacy. But if you look in the shadow that the Bill of Rights casts, it's very obvious that privacy emanates from the document. Um, he provides lots of examples. The First Amendment's prohibition, uh, the First Amendment's right of association, the Third Amendment's prohibition on the quartering of soldiers, uh, the Fourth Amendment's uh, prohibition against unreasonable searches and seizures, the Fifth Amendment's prohibition against self-incrimination. Um, and moreover, he points to the Ninth Amendment and says that the Ninth Amendment sort of wraps it all together and provides you an example of how you get to privacy. So if there exists an example of privacy in the first, third, fourth, and the fifth, and the Ninth very clearly states that just because we didn't write something down in this document does not mean the right is not retained to the people, that all of this creates a penumbra in which you can find a generalizable right to privacy. In particular, the language he uses is that there is a zone of privacy created by several fundamental rights. And that right of privacy, when you look at this case in particular, this question in particular around contraceptions within the marital confines, Privacy absolutely is included in that. Um, he writes, would we allow the police to search the sacred precincts of marital bedrooms for telltale signs of the use of contraceptives? The very idea is repulsion to the notions of privacy surrounding the marriage relationship. Um, so by prohibiting the use of contraceptives or even the counseling of the use of contraceptives, the state has regulated into its, itself into this zone of privacy that emanates from the Bill of Rights. Um, and since this right, this privacy-based right is fundamental, um, states absolutely cannot regulate within it. 
Um, and so the 14th Amendment makes this right of privacy uh, explicitly apply to the states, um, and that states cannot regulate against this type of privacy. Um, and so this, this, this zone of privacy that happens within the marital bedroom uh, is obviously broader than that, which is why Douglas writes the opinion in the way that he does and articulates a very broad understanding of what this right of privacy is. But a couple things that we should get out of the majority opinion um, bef before we go into the concurrences and dissents is that the case in 1965 in Griswold um, allows for the use of contraceptives within a marriage, it still limits the use of contraceptives outside of marriage. And it isn't until 1972 um, that the Supreme Court reads the right for individuals to use contraceptives outside of marriage uh, into this privacy right as well. Um, the majority in this case, Douglas steer clear, steers clear of articulating substantive due process, but they're absolutely invoking it. Um, they're scared of articulating it specifically because they know how much Lochner is disliked. In fact, the members of the majority dislike the decision in Lochner. They dislike the idea of liberty of contract being read into the Constitution by a substantive due process but they're doing the very same thing here in that they're reading a right into the constitution that textually is not there, that being privacy. Unlike previous fundamental rights that the court has invoked, marriage, procreation, privacy in one's home, this privacy definition is exceedingly broad. And so whereas invoking marriage as being a fundamental right or procreation as being a fundamental right or the ability to have privacy in one's own home as a fundamental right, that those weren't seen as, or those aren't very large oversteps about the nature of fundamental rights, but articulating a very broad right of privacy um, and using substantive due process is not unlike what the majority in Lochner did in interpreting a liberty of contract protection into the Constitution where none previously existed. Um, and, and so Douglas gets called out for that in the dissents. Um, dealing particularly with the concurrences, Justice Goldberg concurs, um, and he provided that many personal based rights are protected by a substantive due process. So Goldberg doesn't shy away from what the majority opinion did. Uh, Goldberg uses the language of substantive due process. Um, he contended that the Ninth Amendment absolutely was decisive and that certain rights that are not enumerated in the Constitution, but which are fundamental, can absolutely be protected from government intervention. And that includes privacy and also includes the right to use contraceptives but he uses the language of substantive due process. Um, he communicates it pretty clearly. Uh, Justice Harlan uh, also concurs in this case. Um, Justice Harlan agrees with the outcome, but kind of disagrees with the decision. Justice Harlan says the question about whether privacy is fundamental or not is absolutely not the important issue in this case. Instead, the court must determine whether the law violates violates values that are implicit in the concept of ordered liberty. That's fancy language that simply invokes the view that's articulated in Coulter v. Bull, in that the court can protect some implicit values that are absolutely ingrained in, in being human. I think this is a semantical, a semantic argument because the idea of some sort of implicit attachment of values to people and fundamental rights are saying the same thing in different ways. Um, functionally, what Harlan says and what Douglas say is that 
this right to privacy has to be protected. One says it's a fundamental right. Other says it's a, a, just a value of human beings. Both get to the same end and that privacy is absolutely protected by the Constitution. So I think it's a semantic argument, a semantics argument that, that Harlan uh, um, throws out there. And I think the reason why Harlan throws it out there is Harlan's not a fan of substantive due process. And so his articulation uh, of an understanding um, of how rights uh, emanate from things other than the Constitution gets him around going, well, we read this into the Constitution via substantive due process. Um, so for Harlan, it's sort of a, a shield. Justice Black dissents. Uh, Justice Black is absolutely a, a strict constructionist. Most of the time when we say someone is a strict constructionist, uh, what we mean is someone is a strict constructionist until it disagrees with their ideology. Justice Black is a strict constructionist because Justice Black literally read the Constitution to mean exactly what it says. Um, remember back in the beginning section, the first part of this class, when we did um, First Amendment law, Black was the individual who thought that Congress can absolutely make no laws um, abridging the freedom of speech, that Congress has no role to play in that. Um, so he, he reads the Constitution to mean exactly what it says. Um, so Justice Black in this case writes that the law in this case is offensive, but it's not unconstitutional because there is no specific right to privacy written within the Constitution. That the, the law is offensive, the law is problematic, the law is overreaching, but it's not unconstitutional for Justice Black because it's not explicitly stated in the Constitution. Justice Stewart also dissents. Um, Justice Stewart articulates perhaps the clearest critique of the method by which the majority gets privacy into the Constitution. Uh, and he argues that courts must view issues of personal rights in the same way that courts view issues of economic rights. And that is, leave it to the legislature to regulate in these issues because substantive due process is dangerous. Substantive due process gives courts the ability to read rights into the Constitution that legislatures cannot regulate against. And that's problematic because judges aren't respondent to the electorate and their decisions can't be overruled except by constitutional amendment, which we know are exceedingly rare. So Stewart argues that substantive due process is too powerful of a tool for courts to have because it allows them to legislate in a way that makes it exceedingly difficult for their rulings to be overturned because states and the federal government cannot simply regulate against them because they've read something to be of constitutional protection, which the only means around that is to amend the Constitution. And so while I think Justice Stewart uh, would generally have supported something like an amendment protecting a right of privacy or articulating a right to privacy, he absolutely disagrees with the concept of the court being able to make a decision and read a right into the Constitution that does not exist, that then states are entirely prevented from legislating against unless they can mount an effort to amend the Constitution. Now in the area of privacy, we as a general public might not find that problematic. Wait till we get to Roe v. Wade, because Roe v. Wade is a decision that bases itself in privacy. It is a privacy-based protection. 
And therefore, a court of unelected individuals who is not responsible to the public at all um, makes a decision that guarantees a constitutional right to an abortion. Whether that is advised policy-wise or not, whether you agree with it or not, it seems problematic that something that isn't in the Constitution can override legislatures, especially when the institution that led to its protection is so removed from any sort of influence of the public, and also an institution that's exceedingly slow to change in terms of membership and in terms of view of the law. Courts don't exist to change quickly. Courts are conservative by nature, and by conservative I mean simply resistant to change. Um, and so while Griswold v. Connecticut articulates a right to privacy which I think most individuals can get behind. Um, Justice Stewart correctly points out that legislatures should be playing a role here because when we make a decision that something is constitutional or unconstitutional, what we've done is stop any debate, any innovation, uh, any experimental happenings of democracy within the states, we put a dead stop on it unless two thirds of both the House and Congress can agree and three fourths of all state legislatures can agree. And that's a huge barrier to change the decision of five people on an unelected institution. 